So as we turn to our third and uh, last talk in this little summer series on uh, three ships, uh, lead, uh, discipleship, leadership, we turn today to the theme of apostleship. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you long to birth uh, new works and new ministries in our nation. Thank you that you long to use your church to birth new works that would proclaim the name of Christ and advance his kingdom. So Lord, we pray that today your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, that the glory of Jesus would be our supreme and only concern, and that your word would be our rule. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the theme of apostleship. Now, the word apostle is used in many different ways in the New Testament. Uh, in its widest sense, it speaks of those who are sent by God. Uh, and I want to focus in on that sense where it's referring to those who are sent to birth or to bring something to birth in, in the now, in the, in the moment, in the present, to birth a new ministry, perhaps even birth a new congregation, perhaps even plant a new church or begin some other work for God and for his glory. It's important that we, in the first instance, though, re recognize the unique nature of the first apostles. They were those who were personally chosen by Jesus. They were those who were eyewitnesses to his resurrection from the dead. And in ways that, of course, cannot be repeated. Their teaching had a unique stamp of the Holy Spirit upon it. Nothing can be added to the teaching of the New Testament. However, there is a function, an apostolic function, that remains important for the church of today and today's church. The church today needs to continue to have people who will carry the name of Jesus to new places, to places where the name of Jesus hasn't been taken to, who will put in place new structures, just as what's happening here in the reading that was read earlier. I'm not going to refer to all of that reading, just, just part of it this morning, verses 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, that is to Ananias, Go, for he is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him, that's of course Paul, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. May God in today's church raise up men and women that are clearly chosen by God, called by God, chosen to carry his name to people who don't know his name, chosen to carry his name to places where his name has not been taken, chosen and able to own for themselves the path of suffering, as well as the privilege of making known the name of Jesus. We see first and foremost here in these verses and in today's reading that new ministries of worth and significance are always birthed in prayer. Paul's only a new convert, but already in today's reading, he's found in the place of prayer. And we see here that Paul's attitude towards Jesus has been transformed totally and radically transformed. He had been someone who hated Christ. He'd hated all that Jesus stood for. Yes, Saul was a religious man, a highly educated man, a qualified lawyer. He believes in God, but he doesn't know God. He doesn't know Jesus. Indeed, as Nicky Gumbel puts it, he's out for the kill rather than out to live his life, to serve and love and please Jesus Christ. Rather, he hates Jesus and he hates Christians. And he's on his way uh, to arrest Christians when, whenever he encounters Christ in his life, forever is changed by Christ. He had in the past wrecked 
havoc in the early church. But as he travelled on the road to Damascus, he, he meets Jesus, we read in verses 3 and 4 of Acts 9. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul begins, or Saul as he was at this point, begins to realise that in one sense, the church really is Jesus. The church is Christ's body here on earth. And, and he'll find a new language for that and he'll be able to express that before much longer in a very, very real way when he'll describe the church as the body of Christ. Transformed by Christ, he will no longer persecute the church, but he will now move to a place where he defends the gospel. And, and rather than persecuting the church, he will not only defend the church, but he will so preach Christ, preach the gospel, that he will plant new churches. Such is the transformation the apostolic transformation, the transformation of the spirit that happens in the life of Saul who becomes Paul. He now equates the church with Christ and Paul will love both. He will love Jesus and he will love the church of the Lord Jesus. Having believed in Jesus, he will now be filled more and more with the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What follows is this, that new ministries are birthed, birthed by this man of prayer birthed in the place of prayer. Apostolic leadership will be leadership that will call the church and lead the church in apostolic prayer times. The very mouth that had breathed out murderous threats is now breathing out prayer. Saul has become such a new person that he's given a new name, the name Paul. Ananias finds him praying, not making threats any longer. Our churches today, our churches in this diocese of Down and Moor, need to gather people together to pray. And not just to say prayers, but to pray bold prayers. To pray Holy Spirit filled prayers. To pray for vision. To pray for growth to pray apostolic prayers that will see new ministries birth and perhaps even new congregations brought into existence and new churches planted. Before very long, Paul will write uh, to the church at Rome in Rome ch Romans chapters eight, chapter 8, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Apostolic people pray new ministries into existence. Apostolic people pray new church plants into existence. Apostolic people pray new ministries for Christ that will give Christ glory into existence. Every church in this diocese needs a group of people who will pray and who will pray fervently, who will pray for God to move in our generation and in our day and to establish new ministries in our midst for his glory. So I'm calling upon us to make sure that we are gathering together, that there's groups of people gathering together in our churches to pray and to pray fervently and to pray earnestly and to pray expectantly and to pray together and to pray often and to pray big faith-filled prayers that will see new ministries birthed for God's glory. So the apostolic work of the church involves praying. The apostolic work of the church, secondly, involves preaching. 
preaching is very much at the core of Paul's ministry. And uh, that shouldn't surprise us because what happens here in this reading, verse 15, the Lord said to Ananias, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Paul is called to preach and to preach to Gentiles, to preach to the nation of Israel, to, pre to preach to rich and poor alike. At once, Paul begins that ministry. He begins to preach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We read verse 20 and following. Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Paul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. There's powerful Holy Spirit anointed preaching and this is a season where the church needs Holy Spirit anointed preaching and teaching and people who position themselves for Holy Spirit anointed preaching and teaching and the church needs people who will ask God to make them hungry for Holy Spirit anointed preaching and teaching where we hear that Jesus Christ is the crucified risen ascended and returning Lord and the church needs to go with that message not simply wait for people to come to hear it but we actually need to go with that message. And Paul here is told to go. Uh, I love how John Wimber, when he spoke about his ministry uh, and was challenging church leaders on one occasion at a conference, asked the question in relation to the word go. He said, the Bible tells us to go, but which part of the word go does the church today not understand? Is it the G? Or is it the O? We're told to go. And in our uh, world and in our context, it's to go to people's homes. It's to go to social clubs. It's to go to workplaces. It's to go out into the streets. It's to go anywhere where we will find people who have not yet, as it were, knowledge, acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what Paul does here. He goes to where the people are. And he proclaims that Christ is Lord. His sight recovered, filled with the Holy Spirit. His strength regained. Paul goes. And it's time for today's church to go. To go to where we'll find people who are ready to hear, who need to hear, and who will, some of them at least, hear that Jesus Christ is Lord. So who are the people in your context and in your parish context that don't know Jesus personally? Where do they hang out? Where are the ones that are unlikely to come to your church gatherings? How are you going to connect with them perhaps online? Or how are you actually going to physically go to where they are to tell them humbly and gently and lovingly that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he loves them, that he died for them, that he's for them and not against them, and that he calls them to know him, to experience his forgiveness, his healing, his peace, his joy, and his gift of eternal life. Which part of the word go? Do we not understand? Is it the G or is it the O? Paul's ministry was apostolic. The church today needs an apostolic edge to how we do ministry. The church today needs an apostolic edge to how we do mission. Paul's ministry begins in Jerusalem among the Jews. 
For a short time he returns to Tarsus, the place of his birth. Soon, however, he will go to Antioch where he preaches Christ to the Gentiles. Uh, not long after that, from Antioch, we find him planting churches in Greece and Thessalonica and in Ephesus and in parts of Asia. New churches planted, new ministries birthed. Paul's ministry provides us not only with great teaching, which it does, but also we must not overlook Paul's zeal, Paul's diligence, Paul's commitment to the spread of the gospel and to take the gospel out into the world. This is something that today's church needs to rediscover. So I ask you a couple of little questions. Do you have the skills and the gifts and the passion to, to actually set up something new that would reach a people group in your context that are not being reached? Or might God even be calling you to be part of a new church plant or to be part of planting a, a new congregation or a new expression of church uh, somewhere that God might lay upon your heart that in conjunction with those in leadership and in authority over you, that might be something that would be birthed uh, and that you would be part of. God is looking today for his church to rise up and to be a people who believe that the Bible is true, who believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, who are totally convinced that without Christ, people go out into a Christless, lost eternity in hell. That there is a hell to shun and that there is a heaven to gain. A people who are flexible about how we do church, but rigid around what we believe in terms of the core central beliefs. A church where leadership is permission given, where proclaiming Christ is at the very top of our uh, church's agenda, where we recognize that we need to be reaching those around us. If there isn't a Sunday school in your context, by God be putting his finger on you to be part of commencing a Sunday school that would reach the next generation. By God be challenging you to make space in your attitudes for young families and for young people. By God be challenging you and me to focus more upon the future than we reminisce about the past. Where tomorrow's church is a million times more important to us than yesterday's memories. Might God be asking you to, as a church to get involved in coming alongside another church to help them plant a new ministry or take forward a, a new mission? Should your church be resourcing ministry not only in your own context, but ministry in a context somewhere else in the diocese or even beyond? Are you called to get involved in starting or commencing some new ministry, some new work for Christ and for his glory? I, I love the way that a chap called Robert Learden uh, speaks about apostolic anointing and apostolic leadership and the apostolic work of the church. He, he, he cautions us being fearful of being labelled as extremists. You maybe think that I'm being an extremist in what I'm saying in this sermon. Well, listen to what Robert Learden has to say. An extremist is someone like Jesus, filled with his principles. They go a little further, leaving the average and acceptable norm of the day. If making a bold statement glorifies the principles of God, but labels you as an extremist, a radical, then wear those words as a medal. God never calls you to be average. Average is a mixture of good and bad. Nowhere in the Bible did God call anyone and keep them average. Instead, they built an ark in the midst of chaos. They parted the sea. They marched around walls, causing them to fall. They walked on the water and people were totally healed as their shadow passed by. I love it. 
Many times he, he, he even changed their names to assure the victory. He continues, Yesterday's despised revolutionaries have often become today's trusted pillars of the church. Are you ready for this? The unbalanced ones. The ones who are called by God to do the ridiculous. The unbelievable. The never heard of. The spiritual pioneers inventing new ways of breaking through the walls. They're the ones that do change the world. The place safe, normal, balanced, spiritual middle class. Maintain it. I want us to be a diocese that goes beyond maintenance to mission. Mission that has an apostolic edge that births new ministries and that might even plant a few new churches and new congregations and see all our existing congregations renewed by the Holy Spirit who brings life and who puts Christ back at the centre of people's lives and at the centre of his church. Let us pray. Loving Lord God, I pray that you would forgive what sometimes we have been, that you would transform where needed who we are, and that, Lord, you would order what we and what your church might become, and all for your glory, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.